Gone are the days where you talk about your farm and how many acres and what machinery you have and what you need. You, you can add that, but you actually need to be very big on including what you can offer that person. Hello and welcome to the Shared Ag Solutions Podcast by BCG. I'm Janine Batters and this episode is part of a eight-part series called Planning to be Profitable. Uh, Today we are speaking with Denise McClellan who has extensive experience working with people and safety. I live in Horsham in the Wimmera of Victoria and I farm alongside my husband and as well as that I work off farm supporting businesses on managing their people and, and safety. And how long have you been doing that for? Probably it might be five years or so now. Yeah, as well as doing that, I'm involved with workforce issues in the grains industry through my involvement with the Grain Growers National Policy Group and the National Farmers Federation Workforce Committee. Yeah, wow. So why are you so passionate about this space, Denise? I've always been passionate about the people side of farming and agriculture. And I think in the past, it's been overlooked and we've had a much greater focus on making improvements to our businesses in the areas of production or finance. And finally, probably with COVID and labour shortages, the importance of people and valuing our staff has finally come to the front. It's just an area that I've always noticed that if we get the people thing right, good things will follow for our businesses. People are what makes a good business, aren't they? It's pretty straightforward. Absolutely, absolutely. So setting up for harvest, for example, or sowing or any busy period on the farm, it's such a tricky thing because obviously for a lot of farms, you don't need labour right throughout the year. What are the first steps that you do when you start thinking we need someone? It's not just enough to say, I need an extra person. You need to be quite clear. Is it, do do we need someone that can float between two or three different um, items of equipment or, yeah. So you need to actually think about, make a plan and and lay out your whole team and how it might work and where the actual gaps are. So you can say to people, you might be spending 50% of your time um, on the chaser bin and the other half loading trucks, or you might be 100% on the header. Just people know, because a lot of the time you can employ people under a vague pretext of helping out for harvest and they say well I thought I was going to drive the header and and so getting clarity up front is good for your business and then it's also really good for the the people once they're employed. So managing expectations, communicating that to them. Yeah absolutely yeah. And how long before a busy season so say you start harvesting in November, how long before November would you start thinking about getting someone in? The market is so dynamic and a lot of people, they could be um, what we call backpackers or just everyday Australians. A lot of people like that short-term work and if you have a a good reputation as an employer, you'll often find that people will be sending you emails and CVs six months in advance and you say, that's great, I'll get back to you in three or four months' time. But I, I imagine that you would be thinking about your people needs a few months out from harvest. So if you can have people lined up early and sitting in a holding pattern, it might only be July, but you've got two or three people ready to go in October, if you're starting in November, then then that's great. So I I think the earlier, the better. Sometimes the the market will suit that in that people will be looking, they'll be advertising that they're looking for work in six months time. And then sometimes it it can be quite last minute if you haven't actually got all your requirements met. But I, I think being prepared for at least three months in advance is the way to go. So just hearing you say, you should be having people lining up for you. If perhaps you don't have that, it might be an indicator that maybe you need to keep listening to this conversation, but that would be ideal. So I suppose that's another reason why it's so important to be thinking about your people and looking after them because it'll actually cut down the time you need to be looking for these people. It'll actually help you out in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And at the moment, it is an employee's market. And so they literally, if you can imagine, I know it's all on screen, but if you imagine uh, on a desk, they might have five prospective people that they could work for. And of those five, what's going to make you stand out? Why are they going to pick your business? And that is the reality of what the market is like at the moment. You need to stand out so you can get people to work for you. Okay. So first step is figuring out what you actually need on the farm. The next thing is hopefully you've got people coming to you, but if you don't have people coming to you, what are the best ways to communicate to try and attract people? 
I think social media is just huge these days for both employees and employers. In in terms of farm labour, I follow probably 10 or so Facebook groups and there are always, yeah, both employees and employers advertising and looking for work and Lots of farmers that I speak to and work with, they all find people on the socials. Yeah, okay. So we can probably include some of those links if you're happy to share them in our show notes. When you do advertise on social media, do you just say, we're looking for a truck driver? We need to start two weeks ago. How's best to communicate that? Uh, Yeah, no, not like that. Um, Gone (laughs) are the days where you talk about your farm and how many acres and what machinery you have and what you need. You you can add that, but you actually need to be very big on including what you can offer that person, if it's short-term or long-term. So what can you offer them as a business, as a community and in your region? Because people these days don't necessarily um, move for a job, but they will move for a lifestyle. And you need to think about their family. So talk about um, your community. You could be from a small town, but that's there's nothing wrong with that. You can talk about what's happening in your region. We've got beautiful walks in a national park or we've got lakes for skiing or we've got a, you know, a really supportive local school. Uh, you, yeah, you really need to highlight why you're a good business to work for and then what your community and your region can offer that person as an individual, a couple or a family. Is there anything specific that you should be saying about your business? Yes, money is a given these days. I think you'll be hard pressed to find someone if you're paying the minimum award in the grains industry, for example. So money is a given. It is what else can you offer that person? Actually, one of the big ones is uh, accommodation. And I still get so disappointed when I hear stories of people being putting in appalling accommodation. There's nothing wrong with old or basic, but it needs to be clean. And um, I, yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're not prepared to live in that accommodation with your family, then don't, don't put a worker in crappy accommodation. I I just want to stop hearing stories about Australian farmers putting workers in crappy accommodation. It just does nothing for our reputation. Such an important Mm -hmm. point. So we know what we need. We've advertised well. We've got somebody interested. What next? A good induction, I'm going to say, takes a good couple of hours and then you're showing the person actually around your farm. So a good couple of hours at the kitchen table and then you're showing them around your farm. Generally, it it depends on the business, but you might want um, that person in your business for the week before you start harvest or depending on their skills, if they're very mechanically minded, you might actually have them for the month leading up to it and they might be servicing, you know, field bins and silos and augers and, and actually helping check that everything's good to go. But I would probably say we need to move away from the last minute they turn up on your doorstep and then you put them to work within a few hours. Okay, so you talked about that kitchen table induction. Is that where you would be talking to them about, well, you know, this is what you're going to be doing, but we also would like you to drive the truck or you might also uh, be needing to jump on the chase a bit. Is that where you sort of manage expectations? Yes, you go through everything. You talk about the actual job that they're doing and how you'd like that done, but then you talk about all the other stuff. So you go through an employment contract and the terms and conditions of that contract and you talk about, the you introduce them to the business and how you do things around here, expectations around hours of work. And especially that's a big thing when we are employing people for, say, cropping and harvest. There is an expectation that we do require our people to work longer hours. So you talk about exactly what that means that maybe for four to six weeks we're going to expect you to work six days a week or 12 hours a day or it's a very a unique proposition compared to what might happen on a grain business for the rest of the year. Go through all those employment considerations. If they're staying in your a house or accommodation, you're going to talk about the rules around that. You're going to talk um, about just how your business operates and some of the rules and having a code of conduct, which is this is how we do things around here. So where the first aid kits are located, what happens in an emergency, things like where you park your vehicles or don't park your vehicles or it's the things that you don't know unless you've been in that business for a while. The more you can help someone to get to know the personality of your business and how you operate, the better. Because um, a lot of the time we employ people that have all the skills we need. They're, yep, they've driven headers before and that's great, but they haven't necessarily driven a header for our business in terms of how we do things. And every business is quite unique 
like that. And you do need to help people get to know how you do things on your farm. And I suppose that's also, that's probably also where you have the conversation. I'm just thinking, who who are the chiefs? (laughs) The the line of, because sometimes I think it can be tricky, particularly at harvest, you might have someone saying, oh, can you move that field bin? Can you jump on the truck? Oh, those sheep have gotten out. Is it important then to say you'll be reporting to? Absolutely. And that's a really big one, Janine. One of the quickest ways to turn someone off and have them quit on you is to have too many bosses reporting to. So you need to be quite clear in terms of the line management. So um, you might just have one person that everyone's reporting to, or you can have person A is the person that manages the loading and unloading of trucks. But if you if anything to do with paddock operations, you talk to this person. But you do really need to make it clear who's in charge and who's not. And I always just say, if you get a direction from one person, then something from another, just don't be rude because often it's family members and don't be rude, but just double check so you can get that clarity. That's that culture, isn't it? Rather check, that's probably part of that communication of the culture of we'd rather you check, we'd rather you check and make sure. And the other thing I suppose would be if something's not working for them, that that kitchen table conversation would obviously right at the start be an ideal point to say, well, if something's not working for you, we'd really love to hear it. Yeah, Janine, that's a huge one. We've got to get better at at saying the basic stuff like that. When you've got someone new on, I really encourage the rest of the team to take ownership in supporting that person because a lot of the time the boss will tell the new person to do something and they'll say, yes, 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 I understand. And then they won't say anything to him, but they'll go off and say to someone else, I actually, I didn't get what he was talking about. Can you help me please? So I didn't want to look like an idiot. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's really good if the whole team is invested in supporting and encouraging that new person to get on board as soon as they can. I can see the culture of this business just shaping up. It sounds warm and welcoming. So Denise, Can you elaborate on communication and and how that is important for retaining employees and some of the other things that you can do to to help people want to stay working with you? Sure. So in terms of communication, I think a WhatsApp group or some kind of a chat group is a really fantastic tool for farm businesses because everyone knows what's happening at the same time. And it might be as simple as everyone meet me in the paddock at eight o'clock tomorrow morning and everyone knows, or it could be posting photos of things. And it once people get into the groove of using a chat group, it's just so beneficial. In a farm business, we've got the team in the paddock on the ground, but there are also the other players. And it's the, I'm being a bit stereotypical here, but there's the people back in the kitchen and there could be, you know, parents or grandparents. And it's a great, a communications group that everyone is on means everyone knows what's happening, even if they're not out in the paddock in, in the middle of the coalface of what's going on. And, and people feel like they belong. They actually feel like they're part of the team. I I do often hear in farming families that the members that are in the house or in the office or in the kitchen, they don't necessarily feel valued. A, a chat group is fantastic for everyone. And it's great for posting photos of the stuff ups and the wins and like just cracking sunset photos. Someone posted on our group the other night. And I was like, wow, that was amazing. So I think a a chat group is a really big one. A good boss should be during harvest or during a busy period should be saying every day, okay, this is the plan for today. And um, it might change. It might because things do change quite quickly. But I, I would be saying to your team on the chat group, or you're bringing them together in the paddock. Today's plan is this, or and the, or at the start of the week, the basic plan for the week is going to look like this. We might be in these three paddocks, but we've got rain coming. We're going to aim to do X, Y, and Z. And people do like to know the bigger picture and what's coming up and what that might look like. It is a whole team effort, isn't it? It's the people that are paying the bills. It's the people that are running the food out. Yeah. Um, and if they're happy, it's not just going to help the farm business either, is it? Like I just couldn't help but smile. I'm thinking, yeah, that, that, that could help a few things. I was also interested to hear every day this is the plan. Do you think that would also save time with, for example, phone calls or someone turning up at the paddock and being like, oh, I didn't realise I didn't realise that the header front had broken down. I could have picked that part up from town. Yes, absolutely. The more you can communicate with your staff, the better. And I've never heard of anyone saying, 
there was too much communication. And when you include your short-term employees, your harvest casuals or whatever, in those comms, they actually do feel like they belong rather than I'm just a token operator, come in, do the job and get out. They actually do feel valued and they're the people that will say, oh, I might come back next year or, or and tell their friends. That's I'm just thinking about all the jobs that I've loved. I've done worked at a checkout, done all sorts of jobs, but the jobs that I've loved the most... It hasn't always been about what I was doing. It was about the people I was working with. And if I felt a connection with those people, if I felt like I was part of the team, if we had a bit of a joke or whatever it was, we would just love, any farmer would just love, if they had people lining up to say, oh, would I, would you like, I'd like to drive the chaser bin. Can I, because it would just be so helpful. So I think that's a really important point about connection and making that work environment really good. And as I just say, one one way to do that is is through a WhatsApp group. What else? How what else can we do, Denise, to help people want to stay and for more people to want to come to our businesses? Following on from that, yeah, people don't leave jobs because of the work, they generally leave because of a person. So, and it could be the boss and how how you run, or it could be because of other employees that that potentially haven't been managed as well as they should. So, yeah, when people are looking for jobs and they say, oh, what's it like to work for them? The feedback they generally get back is about how you're treated as a person. So you do want to create that culture where they say, yeah, they actually really look after their people. And so in terms of um, moving forward, in terms of how you can look after your people, it's things like rewarding them in ways other than just straight cash. So it could be cash. It could be a bonus. I know on cattle stations, they'll give you a bonus if you complete the first half of the season and then another bonus if you complete the second half. It depends how that might not be as applicable for us. It may it may be. Things like if it's a rainy day, um, everyone of course wants to sleep and they might want to catch up um, with their family and friends. But Having the small wins like a, bar- a barbecue, or you, you, if we've got three or four days off, you might have a day at the lake skiing. Um, it could be your food and accommodation. It could you could give them a voucher for something in town, or find out what the. It's finding out what interests and what motivates your people. So if someone's a car enthusiast, you might give them a voucher or help buy them some parts for their project that they're working on. But if it's a, a family, you might buy them a voucher to a restaurant or, yeah. But in terms of your longer-term employees, there's heaps of things you can do in terms of retaining them. And as I said, it is looking into what motivates your person. So they they might want, outside of those busy periods, they might want to go to school assembly every Friday morning or they might want to knock off work earlier twice a week for football or netball training. Um, it's really they might want to do some um, training or study and it's supporting them in that. It's Yeah, so it's getting to know that person and what motivates them. And the thing that keeps coming up for me is I think when in these busy times, it can get so busy that all you want to focus on is the jobs. You just think, I just got to get that weed off. We've just got to get that truck to the silo or fix its tyres. Like when things are so busy, I feel like we can get quite narrow in our focus what sort of the business needs too. So I think that yeah. point that you were saying around, I think like zooming out a little bit and going, okay. I know that if I retain these people, I know that if I attract these people, that if I treat them well, in the end, it's going to be good for my business. So I, re- even though it's a busy time of year, I really need to take some time to zoom out and think, what, yeah, what's going to motivate them? Or just take the time to to get that restaurant voucher or yeah. know, whatever it is that, that they like, because I, I, I just feel like probably wouldn't take that much time, but maybe you could schedule that time in that think time, that half an hour, or whatever, which seems half an hour to probably people that are flat out harvesting are just thinking, well, do you think I'm made of time, Janine? <laughs> half an hour. But from what you're saying, if, if we do just spend that little bit of time to, to think about them and what they need. The other thing I was wondering is, Harvest is so busy. It's such a it's a busy time with people that aren't used to that, like sort of short term employees, like casuals, for example. They're not going to be used to that. They they don't know. Right. But also long term employees, like you don't want the long term employees to be burnout. Is there a way mm. to manage that to keep people happy? Because 
I'm sure that the partners, if they've got partners or something and they're thinking, oh, I just wanted to go away on a Christmas shopping trip. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, Janine, this, that is so hard. It's the ultimate dilemma. And I think the biggest thing you, you can do is you have to be up front. So it's saying in this business for six weeks, twice a year, it's go time and we're going to be on and we're going to ask you to do additional hours. And if you ask for a week off, during harvest or seeding, we'll probably say no. If you've got a couple of days that you need off, we'll try and fit that in. But for six weeks, twice a year, that yeah, we are going to have greater expectations on your time. And then to compensate for that in the other times of the year, we'll be much more flexible in terms of how you manage your time on and off the farm. But you, you have to be upfront about it because if we've grown up with it, we know that we're not, everyone's not going to be sitting at the dinner table together every night because that's what you're used to. But lots of people aren't. And you've really got to be crystal clear about that so people know. And and then, you know what, Janine, on the other hand, you actually do get a lot of people that do want to work the big hours and earn lots of money. And as a business, you have a responsibility in terms of everyone's safety, in terms of fatigue management. So you need to be quite clear in saying, we aren't going to be hammering you for 16 hours a day. We, we will decide the rosters based on your experience and what we perceive to be right for you. So for example, in our team last harvest, we had some young people and then we had some experienced people and we said, look, you'll be running different shifts. The less experienced ones were doing eight to 10 hours and the others were doing, I don't know, 10 to 12. But you need to be conscious of both sides of that spectrum. The thing with harvest and seeding is it's a marathon, not a sprint. So everyone gets super excited early and then uh, people who haven't had as much experience working during harvest and seeding, they're all gung-ho, but then it starts to get like hotter or just we're a few weeks in and the fatigue starts to kick in. And I think what you say about managing those expectations and laying them out and saying, you know, and doing that well in advance, obviously it's tricky for the short-term employees, but you can still say it at the start. That's also a good time for them to go, oh, we've just had a baby or whatever it is. If that's not a good fit for them, it's great to be upfront about it because then they it might be disappointing for you, but they might have that opportunity to go, oh, this actually isn't going to fit. And then they're not going to have that because you don't want people to have an experience. Yeah experience and then go and say, oh, they were terrible to work with. I think that's really important. And the other thing I think that was when you were talking about, so managing those expectations around hours, is there guidelines around how many days someone should be working in a row? Because I think that often it can be work until there's a rain. Yeah, there actually are. But like some, a, a few of the farmers that I've spoken to have said they don't work on Sundays anymore. And I was actually quite in, a surprise because they're the kind of farmers that when it's on, it's on and you just don't stop. But they have said that um, their people are, are well rested and their productivity is higher. And you potentially are eliminating those stuff ups that can be costly when you, you're running with tired people. If you're having unnecessary uh, breakdowns or stuff ups that cost you two or three days, you will look back and uh, wish that you had given everyone Sundays off or whatever it may be. Is that during busy times? Yes, yes. I, I, I was actually quite surprised that some businesses are actually going to that, no, we're having Sundays off no matter what. And Obviously, if there's, it, it depends on what's happening. If there's rain coming or whatever, then you might say, no, sorry, we're all going for it. But if you're happily cruising along, I think there is merit in resting your people so they actually do get a full day away. Yeah. And the other thing I'm thinking is that you can't, if you're tired, and I might be speaking for myself, but I know that if I'm really tired, one, I'm not going to be operating at 100%. And two, I'm going to be grumpy. I'm going to be grumpy and I don't, it, that's not good for your work culture either, is it, when everyone's grumpy around? <laughs> no, and if you have got your workforce grumbling, then they are they are clear signs that you need to make some changes. Absolutely. And it's this is related. It's not necessarily about fatigue, but I always say, encourage farmers to say, it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when that you are going to stuff up and hit something, break something, wreck something. And it could cost between $500 and 20000 or more. And this is the kind of business 
that we speak up about those things. If you're running a tired crew, uh, you are increasing your risks of a whole lot of things and it's, yeah, definitely not advisable. It's not good culture, is it? They're not going to they're not going to be going telling everybody, okay, go work for those guys. Yeah, not exactly. That's exactly right. They're going to say, no, they really run their people hard. I'd consider somewhere else. They really love to work. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, so any more ideas, Denise, on things to do to retain staff? I'm giving you a great answer here, Janine. It goes back to your culture and a good culture does take time to develop. So it's doing all those bare minimums right. So you are employing people correctly. You do have contracts in place. You are inducting them properly. You have some rules around your business for bits and pieces, seat belts, or what speed people drive, or it's, it's not necessarily safety related. It's just rules for how we do things here. So then it's having regular team meetings, or it's all those little systems of the more systems you have instead of an ad hoc approach the better your culture is and the more people like working for you. People want to feel valued in that they can think for themselves while they're working for you um, rather than having to ask everything. So this this generation of people is very motivated by not as much by work but more by what they can do outside of work. They're not just turning up to work to earn a dollar. They want to actually enjoy the time that they spend uh, there with you. Yeah, so say halfway through the season, halfway through the harvest or something, someone's feels like they're not, they're working too much or there's a, there's an issue. What is the best way to make sure that person feels like one, they can speak up and resolve that? Because the answer might be, well, we kind of said at the start of the season that you were going to be doing this, but then that person, for whatever reason, might have decided, oh, this is actually just a lot harder than what I thought. But how, yeah, so how do you manage that side of it And how do you make it so that they feel, because they might, if they don't feel comfortable talking to you about that, like, do you have planned regular check-ins? How do you manage that so that they feel like they can speak up so they're not just like grumbling around for the next three weeks? Yeah. So there's two things there. So in terms of having an employee that feels comfortable to speak up, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about before in terms of having your whole team invested in that person. So someone else might tell you as the boss, that person's not feeling good about this. And I often recommend that because when there's an issue with an employee, whether they're underperforming and the team's not happy them or happy with them or they have another issue, I often find that the team will find out before the boss. And so it, it is saying to the rest of the team, when something's going on, we really need you to speak up because we, we'll find out in two or three days' time, but we could have nipped it in the bud earlier. I'm stereotyping here, but it might be the wife when she's coming out to the, the paddock delivering meals or parts or whatever it is, saying, hey, how are you going? And because I often do find that the main farmer is a very focused on operations and rightly so, but sometimes can miss some of those subtle cues that employees will say, such as, oh, I've really, I've got a family event this Saturday. And But the non-operational business partner will often pick up on those cues and say, hang on a minute. So it, it is having the rest of your team invested in supporting that person. And then the second part of that question was, what do you do if you've said to them 10 hour days or whatever it is, and then halfway through the season, they're like, oh, just don't think I can do this. This is actually quite a common occurrence. And if it's as a business, you've got to decide uh, if that person is not the right fit and you just don't think they're going to make it, then perhaps you do say, I don't think this is going to work out and give that person the option of leaving. If on the other hand, you've got an employee that is not performing well and they're causing disgruntlement in the rest of the team, you've got to really make it a critical decision there on do you keep them on? Do we tough it out just to get through the rest of harvest because labor is short and we actually need that person, even though they're creating a bit of chaos? I can't help but thinking, about the castle it's the constitution it's the vibe it just feels like it would be a great place to work and you are going to attract people aren't you if you just have great culture yeah and if people are not speaking up about I don't know how they're feeling or whatever does that mean that they're not speaking up about the fact that they dinged your ute on the back of the thing or that they broke this you just don't want a culture where people don't feel comfortable speaking up because that 
can cause all kinds of headaches financially, safety-wise. There's just so many flow-on effects from having a culture where people don't feel able to speak up and it's not great in the short term or the long term and, yeah, you really need to nip that in the bud. So I feel like in wrapping up, Denise, I feel like a lot of our conversation has been about culture and Mm. we'll come back to the benefits of culture and how that can help farmers be more profitable. What are some of the things that if you're talking to a farmer, I don't know whether you'd want to be talking to them right now if if they're still in harvests and the rains are here and, and that sort of thing. If they're thinking, yeah, Denise, this sounds really great. I'm really busy. Like where I don't know whether I'm going to have time. I think during harvest, you can think about it while you're sitting on a seat somewhere, but nothing's going to happen till harvest is finished. And I would actually say harvest is finished, actually have a break, give your brain a break from thinking about that. And then whether it's February or whatever it is, when you're sitting down and you're doing your annual planning for the year, that potentially is when you would have um, that time to put into your requirements for employees and what that actually looks like. And I have a really basic template. It's a two-page sheet and it shows all the departments of your business. And there's a whole lot of departments that you actually didn't even realize that you had, such as HR, finance, Uh, marketing, admin, Um, and then, of course, there's the operations one. And basically the concept of the sheet is that you put all the uh, tasks that go within that division. So for operations, you've got spraying, sewing, truck driving. You actually go through and you allocate, there's two columns to allocate which people in your business to undertake those tasks. And it it actually shows you where you might have some gaps or are we over-reliant on one person? Have we got one person's name against everything? As the business owner, you might actually say, I like doing the operations, but I don't want to do the finance or or the admin. So you might outsource that to someone else. Or you might say, look, I'm tired of operations. I might, I'd like to work more in this area. And yet you can get a much clearer picture of the the current status of your business in terms of your people needs and where the gaps are. And, And then you can actually advertise for someone much more specifically than just vaguely saying, I need a farmhand. And it really does sound like it's worth it from what we've spoken about today. I'm just thinking from our farm perspective is you could start thinking about, if you're not already, thinking about what motivates those employees. And you were talking about before, like maybe if it's raining, have a barbecue or those sort of things that you could be doing now to just make harvest because some people might have another four or six weeks of harvest. Yeah. And just to touch back on that, a lot of the time I have farm businesses say, we are so tired. We're so exhausted. We don't actually want to, um, we don't have the time or the energy to catch up with our employees out of work hours. And I fully acknowledge that that's completely acceptable. So it is doing things within work hours. During harvest, When you take dinner out to the paddock, if everyone stops for 15 minutes and actually comes together as a group and has a chat, it's only 15 minutes. You're not losing that much time. I think that's actually a really valuable um, moment in your day for everyone to come together and have a chat. And they're the things that people, they're the feel-good factors that they like about their day. Well, Denise, it's just been fantastic to catch up with you and I've just been taking so many notes and I'm I'm looking forward to, to hearing more. I can't wait to... To speak to you again, I love always catching up with you on the phone and and watching your social media too. Thank you so much, Denise, just sharing your wisdom and your experience. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Janine. And just in closing, all I'll say is that I had a farmer say to me the other day that good employees will grow your business, um, which grows your bottom line. Such a great chat with Denise. Make sure you check out the show notes and hit follow so I can catch you again in a fortnight.